So um, what I'm going to do here over the next 15 or 20 minutes is spend a few minutes talking about where we've been, what's happened here, and then spend a few minutes going into kind of where we're at right now, and then what investment changes we're going through, at least at our firm level. And so I'm going to try to keep this fairly high level. Um, I will make jokes about myself uh, uh, along the way. I did go to the University of Nebraska. Um, Greg likes to give me a hard time. Uh, we do joke that the N stands for knowledge. Um, but uh, uh, I do have one other claim to fame. Um, that other claim to fame is I'm one of the few people that you'll ever get to meet that can honestly say they beat Michael Phelps in a swim race. And that is a true story. Now, I might neglect to tell you that I was 21 and he was 14, but it still counts in my book. Nonetheless, a true story. So let's talk about investments for just a few minutes here. Um, the first half of this year has been very challenging. I think all of you have probably seen in some form or another, whether it's in regards to your statements or if you've read online or watched the news, it isn't very uh, tough to undercover or uncover some of the tough news that we've faced. And if I was to articulate that for just a second, what I can share with you is this first half of the year, from January through the end of June, was the worst bond market in the last 40 years. And we measure that by just a quick index, the Barclays Aggregate Bond Index, being down nearly 10% through the first half of the year. In addition, it was the worst stock market to begin a year since 1970. And we measure that by just the simple S&P 500, which was down just shy of 20% through the first half of the year. And a nice way to say this, it just wasn't a good start to the year. And no matter how you were invested, you really probably faced an uphill battle uh, through the first, year, first part of this year. Now, there's some reasons to be optimistic, and I'm going to go through those in just a second here. But as we take a quick look at our, or a quick look in the rearview mirror through the first six months, I think a lot of the pain that we focused here really hit home on more conservative investors. And the reason for that is oftentimes our equity investors understand that there is a risk associated with it. They're willing to accept more ups and downs or more volatility. But our more conservative clients that oftentimes spend most of their time in fixed income investments, they weren't necessarily prepared to have a 10% pullback in their accounts. And that's where we've seen a lot of the pain so far in the first part of the year. So as we look at the rear view mirror, it wasn't a good start. Let's talk about where we're at today and maybe some reasons to be optimistic as we go forward um, into the second half of 2022. So I'm going to share a few things with you, and I, I hope if you want to write them down, you sure can. If you have questions, um, you're, feel free to ask those. But also, um, if you have follow-up questions that you wanted to ask, uh, feel free to, to do that through Greg. But I'm a half glass or a glass half full type of guy. I'm an optimistic guy, and there are some positive things going on in the economy today. Oftentimes, we don't mention those positive things because they don't sell newspapers, they don't get you to click on a link, but there is some positive news. So let's talk about a few of those positive things. Number one, unemployment is back down below where we were pre-COVID, which is right around a three and a half percent unemployment rate across the country. And in certain parts, gosh darn it, it's even lower than that. Now that's a positive for the economic foundation that we're building our economy off of. However, some of us may notice some of the challenges that come with that, whether you know lack of service or maybe even some of your favorite restaurants can't be fully staffed during these time periods because there isn't enough labor to go around. That is a challenge that we face. In addition to record unemployment levels, we also have some positive news with consumer spending. Um, consumers, again, continue to spend more money. Uh, there's an old saying that we have, and that is never bet against a U.S. consumer and their ability to spend money or their ability to borrow money to spend it. When we look at what's taking place right now, what's really fueling the economy um, to, uh, to the state has been 
the U.S. consumer spending money, getting out there, returning to old habits, going back out to eat, taking those trips that they haven't been able to take since COVID, um, and, and really enjoying those services. And that's really helped stabilize the economy over the last couple of months. But by the way, there's also other good news. Um, the other good news that we've seen is earnings. As we look at the second half of this year, that's a very important foundation fundamental block, building block mm -hmm. and one that's going to get looked at very, very closely. As we report second quarter earnings, we're about halfway through our earnings season. And so far, about 78% of the companies in the S&P 500 have met or exceeded their earnings expectations so far this year. Now that's really important because that's going to be a key driver for us as we go into 2023. We've also got some really good news here just recently. In the last week, maybe you saw that the stock market was up. Well, what drove that good news? Uh, what drove that good news is we got a Michigan inflationary report that showed that inflationary pressures from month to month was flat. And even better, inflationary pressures for the year had fallen off of its high of 9.1% down to 8.5%. Now that's a mixed bag of news. The good news is inflationary pressures seemingly have peaked. Why it's a mixed bag is because 8.5% is still a really high number. And that's not a sustainable number for our economy or for any economy around the world today. So that's something that we have to continue to see go down from here to, this, uh, to the end of the year. One last positive note, and that is we seem to have seen a peak in gas prices. And I believe personally that gas prices is a big factor in some of those inflationary pressures, although it's not one of the measures of key inflation. And if you look around the country today, all of our goods, services get shipped uh, whether it's by a ship or a train or a truck. And if they have to pay a higher price to ship those goods and services, that price more than likely is going to get passed on to you as the consumer. So as we have maybe a little bit less uh, gas prices, and we've already started to see those, those numbers come down from peak demand in July, um, we're hoping that that equates to lower goods and services prices as well for consumers between now and the end of the year. And just a little side note here, by rule of thumb, usually when we buy and trade oil, we look to buy, buy oil prices in January and we look to sell them in July. And the reason for that is that follows the consumer demand habits. Usually that we, we start to see a, a pickup in demand in January. And then we see it peak right around the 4th of July when uh, U.S. consumers are driving and doing family road trips. And then through the rest of the year, we usually see demand start to fall off. Uh, no need for, for heating and uh, oil prices. And as we return back to businesses and school, um, demand for oil typically falls off from that aspect. So there is reason to be optimistic that we're going to continue to see lower gas prices through, the, through at least the rest of this year. So I'm telling you the good news, but what's the bad news? What's the challenges? Well, I think we all know some of those challenges, but let's start with the first one. We, we call the R word, recession. Are we in a recession? Are we not in a recession? Well, you know, where I learned economics, recession was taught as two consecutive quarters in which GDP contracted. And by those means, we would be considered to be in a recession today although it would be very, very slight from that aspect. Um, what do I think? To be candid with everyone on this call, I really don't care. To me, when we look at the economy, I wanna see fundamental building blocks. I wanna see growth and I wanna see potential for good news down the road. But the reason why we have this conversation about recession is because we're concerned about the lingering impacts on inflation and what it could potentially do to consumers. And I'm gonna use myself as a personal example here. I reside in Phoenix, Arizona. And in Phoenix, we don't have the greatest distribution for meat. Um, and our meat prices in Phoenix have gotten a little out of control. 
and I'm not talking about going to a specialized butcher shop, but if you were to go to Safeway grocery store in Phoenix and Chandler, Arizona, and go up to the counter and try to buy a pound of filet mignon, it would run you about $39 a pound right now. That's quite a bit of money. And even though I might be able to afford to buy it, or at least temporarily be able to buy it, I'm not willing to spend that much money to buy a pound of steak for $39 a pound. Well, what's happened here? What's happened is inflationary pressures has changed my consumer spending habits. I'm now going to spend my money elsewhere on other goods and services. Maybe I spend it on chicken, maybe I spend it on pork. And that will change the earnings and the pricing of those goods and services. Earlier this year, we already started to see some of those impacts come through on corporate earnings. Um, one of our personal favorites is Target. Uh, for those of you who ever go to the Target store. Now, Target in the beginning of the year had a great earnings report. They made billions of dollars. However, they didn't make billions of dollars selling what they usually sell. They made billions of dollars selling consumer staples, groceries, goods and services. Their sales in regards to furniture, computers, electronics, all of their high profit margin products fell off a cliff. And because of that, if you go back and you look at the target's pricing, you can see that their stock price took a significant hit as consumers shifted their spending. And that I believe is the real crux and the real concern of the overall uh, economy to this day, which is does consumer spending change and ultimately what is its impact on these corporate earnings? I'll use one more quick example here. Buying a car, I have a 16 year old son um, who we just bought a car. Normally we would buy them a used car, but gosh darn it, the used car prices were just as expensive as the new car prices. And if I wanted to buy a new car at a dealership, I had to pay a premium if I wanted to walk away with that car that day. So what we did instead is we ended up ordering directly from the dealer from the factory, which took about eight months to get that car delivered. That changes consumer spending habits. There's concerns about U.S. consumers and what we're going to do forward. And we have to be able to address it. Now, on one hand, I'm kind of like the weatherman. On one hand, we got some good news, some positive. On the other hand, we have some concerns. As we move forward though, there are reasons to be optimistic. So let's change the conversation from today to what we think happens over the course of the next six to 12 months and spend just a minute or two looking at some of uh, changes we're making inside of our investments. So what do we think happens over the next six to 12 months? Well, on the equity side, we think that we're going to see maybe this temporary um, increase in valuations. And we think that between now and the end of the year, we could see maybe another potential five to 6% increase on the S&P 500, where we see the stock market enjoys a little bit better performance than we had the first half of the year. We don't think that we actually get back to where we were to start the year. And the reason for this performance that we think that we're going to see between now and the end of the year is going to be because inflationary pressures are starting to go down. And what that signals to the Federal Reserve is that signals that they don't need additional rate hikes further than what's priced into the stock market. Now, where things could get sideways would be if we have another surprise on inflationary report next month that could sure send a whole lot of volatility into the stock market. So there's reasons to be optimistic there but there's also reasons to be concerned. Now you've noticed I haven't hit on such topics such as Ukraine and Russia. Certainly something that we're gonna keep an eye on, but we're talking short-term and domestically what's going to be happening here in the United States. I think the more interesting conversation happens to be around fixed income investments. And that first half of the year, which was really tough, has some degrees of upside potential here. You see, while the news is reporting about rate hikes, most of us as an institutional investment professional are already talking about when we think the first rate cut 
is going to come by the Federal Reserve, which we believe will be sometime in the early part of 2023. And they'll do that to avoid recessionary pressures as earnings kind of hit a little bit of a snag in next year, in the second half of the year, as consumers continue to spend their spending habits with prices so darn high. Speaking of inflation, we think that we're going to see it by the end of the year kind of be at that six to six and a half number for inflationary number, down from the eight and a half percent where we are today. Now, just to pause, that is better than where we currently are, but unfortunately, that's still a really high number. And we do need to see inflationary pressures continue to creep back down into that one, two, three percent numbers to get really excited about the stock market again. So what are we doing as an institutional investment professional? What are the changes that we're making inside our underlying investments? And if I could, for just a second, I'm going to share a screen. And uh, on this screen that you're going to see come across, I'm actually logged in on two different places. So you can still see me and you can see this screen that I'm talking about, which is going to be bubble charts. And uh, I'll see if I can make that a little bit bigger for everyone here. So this is how we are investing money right now. And again, I kind of keep it simple. I graduated University of Nebraska where the N stands for knowledge. I do better with graphs. And so what we're doing here is an arrow indicates a movement up or down on what we're doing or what changes we're making um, to the portfolios. Now, there's a lot of movements that are taking place here. But when we look at this, I wanted to give you a little bit of a guidance. This is from the previous quarter. So as you look here, you can see a little bit of movements taking place. But as I scroll down to the fixed income, there is not a whole lot of change going on. What I want to do now is I want to show you our outlook as of today. And this just kind of gives you a little bit of background on maybe a few little changes or a few little tweaks that we're making to the portfolio. And it gives you a little bit of a base or a little bit of a background in regards to what have we done previously with our portfolios. Because I think that's really important to have an idea in regards to what we're doing for changes from today going forward. And so as I pull that up here and scroll over to the right screen, you're going to see a lot more change this time around. So now I want you to look at that same screen that I showed you previously. And you can see a lot of bubble changes taking place now. Um, not so much in regards to our overall allocation in regards to should we have more equities or more fixed income investments. But if you look at the middle part of the screen where I'm hovering, we're making a heck of a lot of changes on fixed income. And so I'm going to walk you through these changes real quick. And I'm going to give you one last piece of advice and then I'll be quiet. Um, on an equity front, we're not adding more stocks to the portfolio right now. We're just changing around the stocks that we currently have. We're selling some of our large companies like the Apples and Microsofts of the world. And we're buying some smaller companies that are technically in the mid cap space. Companies like O'Reilly Auto Parts or Quaker Oats, medium sized corporations that you've heard of, but you probably don't think of first when it comes to investing. These mid cap stocks are a much better valuation than our large cap stocks. And that's why we're increasing our exposure in the mid cap space. But as I scroll down here and take a look at that middle section with all these movements, these different bubble movements on the fixed income side, we're making a lot of changes. And having been in this industry for over 20 years, I will tell you that we're making more changes today on fixed income investments than we have over the last 10 years combined. And the reason for that is we believe that the Federal Reserve and the market has priced in all of the rate hikes that we think are going to take place. 
And we're more now interested in regards to rate cuts and who is going to benefit from a rate cut environment. So the first two arrows that you will see will be buying US treasuries and, US, and commercial backed mortgage securities. We want to get as closely correlated to the US government bonds as we can if we believe that there's going to be a rate cut, which is why you're seeing us increase our exposure right now from that aspect. You're also going to see beneath that a two bubble movement. Now, I always tell people we're a conservative corporation out of Des Moines that manages money all over the world. In fact, we manage over $200 billion just out of two Union Square in downtown Seattle. But we rarely, if ever, make a two bubble movement. And I bring that up because it's important to know if we're making a two bubble movement, that means that we have a really high conviction. And in this point in time, that two bubble movement is we're actually selling out of some of the high yield bond positioning. And the reason for that well, the reason simply is the game is over for high yield um, refinancing. For the last 10 or 15 years, poor corporations have been able to continue to stay afloat by refinancing their debts year after year as interest rates went lower. But as interest rates have ticked back up, as they've gotten more expensive, that game of refinancing for poor corporations has ended. And they're faced with the trouble of either paying their debt or refinancing at a much less favorable position. And what we think we're going to see here is we think we're going to see defaults start to pick up. And what that means in the high yield world is you're not gonna lose your money, but your money might get tied up for a year or two as a default goes through the court system and which no interest would be paid. There's better fixed income investments out there to this day with better credit quality and better upside potential than what we currently see in the high yield space. One of those is in preferred securities. Um, those, are, those are typically issued by banks or financial institutions to satisfy their testing requirements um, to make sure that they're solvent for the federal government should something extreme ever occur. So you see us increasing that space as well. I want to spend one last second here, as you can see some of those changes, and talk just a little bit about international equities. Um, international equities certainly are much more attractive from a valuation standpoint than U.S. equities. However, there's concerns about how hard a recession could hit Europe. And I'll just share with you real quick, we had a phone call with one of our economists in London earlier this week. And in that, she shared that her normal utility bill runs about $800 in London. To me, that sounds like a really high number. But she said currently her utility bill is $2,400 a month. And the reason why it's so high is because demand for energy is high and supply for energy in the United, uh, United Kingdom and the rest of Europe is low. And their fear is that between now and the end of the year, when need for gas and oil to heat homes goes up, that the utility pricing could go as high as $4,000 a month for her. Now, while she may be able to temporarily sustain that, the average European cannot. And at the end of the day, that could have a crippling effect on the overall European economy, which is why we're not currently investing more money into it, despite the fact that those valuations are much more attractive. So in the end, what I tried to do here is spend just a few minutes talking about what happened in the first part of the year, the second half of the year, which is what are some reasons to be positive and optimistic? There is some good news going on. And just to show you a little bit about what's going on behind the scenes as professional institutional money managers, what changes are we making? My one piece of advice for you right now, when it comes to fixed income investments, I'd strongly encourage you to reach out to an investment professional, whether Greg or someone else that you know, because there's so many movements taking place, you probably don't wanna to try to attempt to do this one yourself. 
And I strongly encourage you to incorporate a third party in regards to helping you navigate this current environment. So I believe I've gone my time here. So let me stop. I'm happy to ask, answer any questions that would come up. Um, otherwise, thank you very much for letting me join in on your uh, meeting today. Questions? Go ahead, Brian. Uh, you didn't, when you talked about bonds, you didn't touch on municipal bonds. I'd love to hear your take on their relative value. Yeah, so so municipal bonds. Um, municipal bonds, first for everyone on the call, just at a high level. Municipal bonds are bonds typically issued by the federal government or by the state. Um, generally speaking, a lot of people like the, the uh, state municipal bonds because you can receive income on that state income tax-free. Right now, our states in general are actually in really good condition, and a lot of them are showing uh, cash surpluses. So from a credit quality perspective, they're very attractive. And we like municipal bonds over the long term, looking out maybe over one or two years. However, I would be cautious to say that municipal bonds typically have a little bit longer duration, which means they can be a little bit more volatile, volatile than at times than maybe some other fixed income asset classes. So we might still see a little bit more up and down movement out of those municipal bonds that, uh, for the next six months. But if your time horizon is you know, a year, two years, three years down the road, I think that they're a, a certainly a very attractive investment to keep in mind. Phil. Are there any questions on Phil? <clears throat> yeah, thank you. Uh, very interesting presentation. Uh, appreciate it very much. I was wondering, you were recommending treasuries. Uh, which uh, end of the treasury uh, realm yeah. are you uh, most recommending? A 30, 10, 5, 2, Six. Great, great question, um, Phil, and, and um, for for the uh, for the everyone else on the call. Um, the U.S. government issues Treasury bonds, Treasury bills, Treasury notes, um, depending upon the the length of time. Um, one of the most popular gauges is the ten-year Treasury, often to, often just referred to as the ten-year. One of the most interesting things going on right now is the two-year Treasury is paying more interest than the 10-year treasury. And kind of interesting because you tie your money up supposedly for 10 years versus tying your money up for two years. Um, the reason for that is the current economic conditions that we're in and believing that we're probably going to see a rate cut before we would ever get to that 10-year note. Candidly, we'd go more the intermediate route, Phil. So I'd be looking for something in that two to three year time frame right now um, that would probably where we would be targeting um, because we believe that that is one that has gone up significantly since the beginning of the year. Valuation is most attractive and could potentially with a rate cut see one of the bigger declines. And keep in mind in, in the bond world, when the interest rates go down, the value of the bond goes up. So it's an inverse relationship. So we kind of want to get in with the ones that are on the more expensive side right now. Other questions? Yes, Greg. Thank you. Josh, uh, what are the, um, what's the correlation between what's been going on in Ukraine um, year to date and maybe going going forward if things were to get worse over there? And how does that um, uh, impact our economy? So, you know, there's there's a couple of different ways to look at that, Greg. Um, for, first off, if, if I was to say from a pure economic standpoint, um, Ukraine is is not very meaningful. It's it's roughly the same economy as the state of Iowa. Okay, so from a from a pure economic standpoint, not much there. The bigger conversation is certainly the unintended impacts. So number one, um, some of you may or may not be aware that Ukraine is one of the largest um, providers of wheat around the world. And uh, they control, I think, 25% of the entire wheat market. Hard to farm your hard, hard to be in your farm when you're out fighting a war. And that is certainly a, a challenge. And, and if I take that back a little bit, we haven't seen those prices come through because we're living off of last year's wheat. Harvest will come in, in October, November. And what will happen when there's less wheat from that aspect. I think you're going to see strong, strong, 
you know, demand on some of those commodity prices continue to flow through, even if the Ukraine war was to stop today, we still probably haven't seen some of those challenges in regards to food prices. But I think where everyone likes to focus in is the implications with Russia and the gas prices. Um, that certainly, while had a, an impact here in the United States, and certainly, you know, gosh darn it, uh, I travel all over the country, uh, all over the world. And, you know, I paid, I think at my peak, I paid uh, nearly $7.50 for a gallon of gas in downtown San Francisco. That's not a sustainable number in an economy. Nothing will kill an economy faster than that type of gas prices. Here, domestically, that's abided a little bit. It's come down. It's not great, but it's better than where we were. Across the rest of the world, European countries don't have relief in sight. And that's a genuine concern. And why it should be a genuine concern to us domestically, even though it doesn't impact us in a straight line, the reality is some of these countries buy our goods and services. And it's gonna be pretty hard for them to afford our goods and services if their money is spent elsewhere. And then you couple that with a soaring US dollar. Some of you may have seen in the news that, hey, the US dollar is actually higher valued than the Euro now. That's the first time in decades that that ta has taken place. The good news, if you're gonna take a trip to Europe, now would be a wonderful time to do it. The bad news is that makes our goods and services very expensive across the seas. And that could have a, an impact. But I think the true answer there is, I think it's too early to really tell you how big of an impact that's going to continue to have. I think as we get closer to doomsday or closer to you know harvest season and not being able to fully get a wheat harvest out of there, you could see some pretty big impacts here and around the world in regards to food prices. And that's my biggest concern, Greg. Thank you. Any other questions? Yes. Quick question on the uh, states such as Washington and Oregon have a mandatory minimum wage increase based upon the CPI, based upon yeah. the inflation that has taken us. That's going to be a healthy uh, hit to a lot of businesses on the increase in the minimum wage and the domino effect on wages. Uh, how does that factor in? Yeah, you, you know, this, this has actually been an ongoing conversation for, for several years. Um, you know, if, if we go back, I think Seattle a couple of years ago increased their, they were one of the first to have the minimum $15 wage um, and then kind of increase from there. If we use that as kind of a, of a, you know, a little bit of an education or study background, what we found is the good news was for those that worked for that, it worked out really well and it actually helped sp spur some of the economy. But it also resulted in higher unemployment um, because corporations weren't able to maintain the same level of employment numbers with that higher pricing. And so it was kind of a catch 22. So for those that were still working and had their job, it was beneficial and beneficial for the economy. But for those that got caught up, some people lost their jobs as a result of that higher increase. So we, we walk a really fine line in regards to it, right? And for, you know, the Walmarts of the world, for the, for the you know, Microsofts of the world, a dollar more, they're going to be okay, folks. They're going to have the earnings to do it. My bigger concern is on the smaller mom and pop shops that have to compete. And, you know, a, a dollar here doesn't seem like a lot of money, but it can add up pretty dramatically. So then the question becomes, does that business have the ability to pass on those additional expenses to consumers? Will consumers still continue to spend at the same rate if they have to pay a higher price? And the answer is that's a mixed bag. And uh, most companies don't have that strong of a consumer base that they can just simply pass off inflationary prices. And I don't care if we're talking about a large corporation or a small corporation. So I think it's good intentions and there could be some good and bad come out of it. Um, and unintended consequences is, is one of those things that we hate to see, 
but of real concern here. And so I don't have a crisp, clear answer that, hey, this is exactly what's going to happen if we do raise that number up. All I can go off of is based upon previous examples, which show that in some cases there are some benefits, but there's the un unattended unemployment that goes up as well. Is it offsetting? Is it enough to make that? I don't live in that community to tell you. And in, in whole, that's, that's something that everyone has to grasp and, and deal with one way or another. Well, thank you, Josh. We really appreciate it. I'm very enlightened. Thanks, everyone. I appreciate the opportunity to speak, and I hope you all have a wonderful day. Thank you.